one of the most skilled and competent of whom was a guy by the name of uh, Richard W. Johnston. They, they hired him, and he was the one who was responsible for reducing to practice one of the key elements of my concept, the so-called modulating inverter. And he did an outstanding job with that, and it worked exactly how my concept had envisioned it. In prior episodes, we have told the story of brilliant minds that were immigrants that were trying to escape war-torn Europe, the poverty of the Middle East, as well as the caste society of India. Rarely in our research did we interview men that were born and raised in the Midwest. It would prove even more enlightening when that man would be the friend and right hand of the head of the Electric Drive Division, Dr. Paul D. Agarwal. Richard Johnston and Paul Agarwal worked directly and jointly together for almost 20 years. Richard was the engineer and Paul was a scientist. Both were dedicated company men and raging workaholics. It was a good fit and the two men would collaborate and work constantly in joint endeavors. Our research team caught up with Richard living in a small town retirement home in Indiana with his adoring wife Lois. This small town had a population of less than 2,000 and it rang of days gone by. We had a lot of questions that remained unanswered and this was the man to resolve them. The document trove that was obtained from the Agarwal interview had been littered with documents that included both men's names. And who better to explain the idiosyncrasies of the General Motors Defense Labs than the man who spent every day with the head of the division. We settled in on the floor in the couch of their living room, iced tea was served, and the reminiscing began. Richard started with the highlights of his career. Dick had designed the changes that were incorporated into the design and the construction of Electrover 2 with the modulating inverter, and shared credit with Paul Agarwal on the project. According to Dick, this was a necessary revision to Electrover 1, an electric car that had been designed and built by Jalal Salihi and George Spix. It was a necessary change to position the evolution of this technology for the upcoming perspective programs of the lunar vehicles, as well as hybrid automotive technology. One of the most uh, skilled and competent of whom was a guy by the name of uh, Richard W. Johnston. They, they hired him, and he was the one who was responsible for reducing to practice one of the key elements of my concept, the so-called modulating inverter. Uh, and he did an outstanding job with that, and it worked exactly how my concept had envisioned it. So Agarwal directed that whole crew and uh, was, of course, in charge of reducing my concept to practice in the Electrover 1, Electrover 2, uh, in the Electrovan. Some aspects of my concept ended up on the lunar rover. While Jalal was tasked with creating an electric vehicle for consumer applications, the team of Paul Agarwal and Richard Johnston we're already working on ways to expand the potential end uses in additional applications. This would render Electrover 1 obsolete upon completion, all because Jalal wasn't looped in to the potential military applications. This would be a necessity for Paul's career because Jalal was the only scientist with more education and experience than Paul himself. Jalal had patents from his time at the Lenkirk Company that were already valued at several hundred million dollars. And that kind of experience has powerful friends. Jalal had been hired at the bequest of these friends without even an interview. He was a threat to Paul's leadership. And there I had a few friends. Some of them were from Linkard, you know, that I was working before, very nice. Three or four good friends, you know. One of them was transferred to Santa Barbara. So he found me a job at General Motors, joined General Motors Defense Laboratory, without interview. So Paul trusted Richard Johnston with the classified nature of many of these military electric drive applications. They worked on them jointly, and they waited for the need for the build of Electrover 2 to transpire. That's exactly as it played out, of course. I suppose that's what happens when geniuses plot to replace geniuses. Ironically, it was a lack of that job interview that helped erase Electrover 1 from the history books. 
But I think uh, maybe it has to do with the fact that I didn't have citizenship. Yeah, because when yeah. I came here, you know, and when, when I'm working in, at that time, in general, I didn't have the U.S. citizenship. I mean, they don't want a foreigner uh, to get involved in a defense, you know. It was in these interviews that U.S. citizenship issues were dealt with early, before the new scientists would even write papers for accreditation. This was overlooked in the case of Jalal. And with the predicted failure of the feasibility of electric drive technology in consumer applications such as consumer cars on the horizon, the only application left for corporate monetization was that of the pursuit of military contracts. Jalal was not a U.S. citizen, was not mentioned in the original General Motors electric drive patent application, and would prove to be a political liability in the pursuit of military contracts. And with that reoccurring question finally answered, Lois chimed in. She was proud of her husband and all of his accomplishments. He had a tenure that spanned 27 years with General Motors. He shared the distinction of having 17 United States patents that were registered in those years with General Motors, working in conjunction with Dr. Paul Agarwal. But his retirement couldn't have come sooner for her. The long days that spanned into the late evenings without her husband at the bequest of Dr. Paul Agarwal, the phone calls late at night that were followed by impromptu idea discussions with Dr. Paul Agarwal in the front seat of his car, the transplantation of her entire family halfway across the country to California, away from the majority of her relatives. Well, she had waited for the day that Richard would finally settle down into a quiet teaching job and pursue his love of woodworking and astronomy. This ironic fact was not lost on us, and I found myself wondering if fate had intervened with Richard's involvement in the electric drive propulsion of the lunar rover. No one else on the General Motors electric drive patent had grown up as a little boy staring at the stars and dreaming of being an astronaut, but this Midwestern genius had. And with that, our iced tea was refilled and Lois began to thumb through her family photo albums. Richard W. Johnston was born on July 27, 1925 in Delaware, Ohio. At a very young age, his family relocated to Huntington, Indiana, where his lifelong love for radio electronics was born. Typical of most technologically driven children, he was constantly disassembling engineered devices to see how they work. In addition to his love for electronics early on, he also loved his high school sweetheart, Lois. The same Lois that gained my respect just a few moments prior. Dick and Lois were married on August 30th, 1946 when Richard had been teaching night school in electronics and electrical engineering. Two children would soon follow, Thomas and Brenda, and so would the need for a respectable salary increase. Teaching wasn't an enterprise that paid very well, and Richard was right in the heart of General Motors' backyard. Richard was hired on the spot in 1953 by General Motors for manufacturing development. It was a perfect fit for his abilities. He would be tasked with reducing mechanical ideas to practice. And as fate would have it, he was recognized and promoted to the General Motors Defense Systems in 1961 in Santa Barbara. Richard was one of the charter employees of the General Motors Defense Laboratories, and it afforded him the opportunity to work in conjunction with Dr. Paul Agarwal, Donald Friedman, John Wirth, as well as Dr. Howard Wilcox on the early days of the electric drive high performance research. These efforts would lead to his recognition by Dr. Howard Wilcox on July 15th of 1963 for credit in the original General Motors electric drive patent application that was submitted three days later on July 18th of 1963 and accepted for patent on May 30th of 1967. It had been an eventful period of several years for Lois. The kids were adjusting to the California lifestyle quite well because of their young age, but Lois had grown up in the Midwest and she relished the family time that seemed to grow more and more infrequent as the bond between Richard and Dr. Paul Agarwal continued to grow. Fortunately, she was a member of the aforementioned Wives Club, so a lending ear was always easily acquired. Richard had begun work on Electrovere II with Paul, and there was rumors of legal proceedings or congressional hearings on the perceived failure of the electric car program in Santa Barbara. 
Well, they thought uh, an outfit like the Defense Research Lab in Santa Barbara uh, were in a good position to do something that was a, sort of a little bit blue sky. They, there was no concerted uh, effort at GM to come up with an economically viable and, and uh, performance, uh, high performance electric cars. They just thought, since we were more of a blue sky outfit in Santa Barbara, why not give it a try? Why not see what could be done? Could we overcome the, uh, the low performance barrier? Uh, and could we overcome the, the efficiency barrier of all that had transpired before in electric cars? They were giving us a bit of a free hand. The electric drive group had enjoyed incredible corporate autonomy and corporate oversight was limited to inner office memorandums between Dr. Agarwal, Donald Friedman, Howard Wilcox, and Dr. Hofstad. In reality, there had been very little accountability for this division in consumer-based technologies. It was simply a logistic nightmare for corporate to oversee. Consequently, it was decided to relocate the entire division to the General Motors Technical Center in Warren, Michigan. The final touches on the assembly of Electrover 2 would be achieved in Warren, and Richard was one of those individuals that was constantly traveling between Santa Barbara and Warren until the division's transfer was complete in early of 1967. These activities included the electric drive reliability testing that was performed on rolling skeletons of General Motors' newest sports car, the Chevrolet Camaro. Dick and Lois were in the final group to finally achieve relocation to Warren. Richard had remained in Santa Barbara until the very last moment, working on the pending military applications for this technology, most notably the electric drive of the Lunar Vehicle Program. It was decided by Dr. Howard Wilcox to leave the Lunar Vehicle Program as it existed at that moment in Santa Barbara. Several scientists and engineers that were in charge of lunar soil mobility testing were left behind for this purpose, most notably Dr. Becker, Frank Pavlix and Sam Romano. But all of the scientific thought, prototype activities, and development mock-up of the Lunar Vehicle Electric Propulsion programs were absorbed by Delco products in virtually finished form. There would be no further need for the electric drive division in Santa Barbara because the electric drive research and technology was complete. Preliminary astronaut training vehicles were already slated and it would be a waiting game for final approval from NASA for a pending Apollo missions. Back in Warren, it was a massive adjustment for Dr. Paul Agarwal and Richard Johnston. Over half the division had quit because they had no desire to work in the frigid winters of Michigan. Additionally, the autonomy that the division had enjoyed quickly unraveled. The corporate oversight was intense and the first confidential restricted activities reports were handled in a traditional manner. Dr. Paul Agarwal would spend the majority of the first year working with Richard in an office environment documenting the division's activities during its time in Santa Barbara in its entirety. Projects ranging from 1962 to late 1966 were documented and presented as work accomplished during the transition period. There was such a backlog of undocumented programs without corporate oversight, this catch-up exercise continued well into 1968. Over the years, Richard had many collaborations with Dr. Paul Agarwal. The two were perfect teammates, and their friendship would transcend into their private lives as well. The two families remained close until Richard's well-deserved retirement in 1980, a retirement that his adoring wife, Lois, had waited so many years for. His friend, confidant, and boss, Dr. Paul Agarwal, would die eight years later. Late in 1969, the electric drive division's work would finally bear fruit with General Motors' acceptance by NASA as a subcontractor for lunar vehicle construction for the Apollo 15 mission. As was corporate policy, individuals were not encouraged to receive recognition for their corporate endeavors. This recognition was even discouraged with active non-disclosure agreements. This credit was reserved for the division that was named in the contract award. This was not always practical, as the press frenzy surrounding Frank Pavlix and Sam Romano can attest. But despite Delco Electronics Division being given credit for the electric drive division's work that had begun almost eight years earlier, there was at least one man that didn't care. A man that had been captivated by the stars since he was young, 
watched as his electric designs and controls transversed the landscape of the moon.